Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by the last man standing with loserpool.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu, and this is the Chronicles AFC Daily. On today's edition, we'll be delving into that update provided by David Ornstein on the Wilfred Zaha situation. We'll be talking about Gabriel Martinelli, the future of Emiliano Martinez and the Lionesses' narrow defeat last night in the World Cup semi-final at the hands of the USA. David Ornstein of the BBC has reported that Crystal Palace are incensed at the bid uh, Arsenal made for Wilfred Zaha just a couple of days ago. Uh, he, he said that Crystal Palace feel that Arsenal are trying a, a few little dirty tricks here and there. He didn't use those words, but that's what he was insinuating. Um, to try and use Zaha's desire to join Arsenal as a way of forcing uh, Crystal Palace to sell. Now, the reports say Palace believe Arsenal's method in this case is outdated and naive. They have no intention of lowering their valuation and are confident that Zaha's relationship with the club is long-standing and strong enough to ensure he resumes his duties without a problem if a move does not come to fruition. So, it feels as though um, you know Arsenal have made this bid and, and all it's done is literally piss off Crystal Palace because Crystal Palace clearly do value this player uh, very highly. We spoke about it with Harvey Jones on yesterday's edition, who's a, a well-known Crystal Palace fan and, and vlogger. And he said that, you know, Wilfred Zaha may not be worth £80 million in other people's eyes, but to Crystal Palace and for how important he is to them, that is a fair sum of money. And so, you know, you've got to understand that as well. It's about what he's worth to the seller, isn't it? Rather than what he is to the buyer, because ultimately you have to persuade them to sell. Um, but, you know, there are reports flying around that Arsenal's deal or Arsenal's offer, I should say, of £40 million was not a lump sum. It was uh, set up in, you know, a payment plan over a period of time and, that would then, wouldn't it, suggest that Arsenal are indeed cash-strapped at this moment in time for this summer and need to do any sort of big money deals that way by paying bit by bit. But the problem is with that is that clubs are very reluctant to accept things like that because what does that mean? It means that they can't go out and get a replacement straight away, does it? You know, if you give them £40 million for Wilfred Zaha, for example, but it's spread over three seasons... At no point will they have a lump sum to be able to go out and get a direct replacement for the player. And, and you know, then there's talk about offering players to, to Crystal Palace as part of the deal to try and sweeten it up a little bit. But do Crystal Palace want our cast-offs? Do Crystal Palace want to pay some of our cast-offs the wages that they've been getting at Arsenal? And ultimately, these players have to want to make the move too. So... You know, it's all getting a little bit messy. I think a lot of us jumped the gun when we heard that Arsenal had made a bid and that Zaha was interested. We thought, yes, this is going to happen. No problem. Sorted. Done deal. But Crystal Palace look as though they're really going to dig their heels in here. And, um, you know, if they do end up demanding such a huge sum of money, is Wilfred Zaha worth purchasing? Maybe not. I've said it over and over again. I wrote a piece for Vavil uh, just a couple of days ago, which you can find on my Twitter. It's the pinned tweet where I spoke about the fact that I like Wilfred Zaha. I like what he brings to the table. I like the fact that he, he's good at dribbling, he's direct, he's dangerous, and he takes the game directly to his opponents. But my worry is that if that prevents us strengthening defensively, it will all be in vain. So Arsenal need to, to reassess this now. Can they afford what Crystal Palace want in one lump sum, or at least to give most of it in one lump sum? The answer seems to be no. It seems as though uh, Crystal Palace now have their backs up because they feel that the offer we made was laughable, embarrassing, etc, etc, and, and quite frankly disrespectful. So you know, there's a long way to go in this one. Uh, we're also hearing that Wilfred Zaha won't ever train with Crystal Palace again. I'm not sure uh, that that's entirely accurate. Like Ornstein says, uh, you know, Palace and Zaha do have a good relationship and, uh, you know, I'd be very surprised if that was the case, if Wilfred Zaha returned from the African Cup of Nations and completely refused to, to take part in any training or anything like that. There's a long way to go in this one. I think this is a transfer saga that is probably going to rumble on for the most part of the window. Um, but let's wait and see how it goes. Let me know what you guys think, um, A, about the prospect of signing Wilfred Zaha and B, about Arsenal's offer. Do Palace have every right to be wound up about it? When I heard 
that that was the type of offer that Arsenal had made. And, it, you know, these are reports. I have to stress that. My initial thought was, here we go again, and I'm not surprised. And that kind of tells you everything you need to know about the way we've been doing negotiations in recent years and how bad we've been at, you know, pulling off uh, deals. On a more positive note, Arsenal yesterday completed the signing of Gabriel Martinelli. It was a signing that we all knew was in the pipeline for quite some time, uh, but it couldn't be announced for various reasons, uh, the main one being the Adidas deal. Apparently, that's why it was. It took so long for it to be announced. Arsenal were, were forced to wait for the kit to be launched before they were allowed to do anything uh, regarding Gabriel Martinelli. Interesting, but that's the way of modern football, isn't it? Uh, Gabriel Martinelli spoke a little bit about him on yesterday's video that I put out in the evening. Huge reputation in Brazil. Uh, somebody who is quite clearly a, a good prospect for the future and fingers crossed we'll see the best of him at Arsenal. But like I said on yesterday's video, if you're going to splash out five, six million pounds on a young player and take a little bit of a risk, I'm OK with that. Um, I haven't really got an issue with that. He's a young Brazilian kid. Uh, who's clearly got a lot of talent based on um, sort of some of the glowing reviews he's received. Uh, won a few personal accolades too in his time with Ituane. Is that how you say it? I think I've said that right. Uh, back in Brazil. So yeah, uh, feeling positive about this one and just glad that we finally got a signing over the line. And, you know, I'm not saying now that the floodgates are going to open and Arsenal are going to be bringing in players on a daily basis, but it's a start, isn't it? And, uh, you know, people can cool down a little bit now and, and look forward to the rest of the window. Fingers crossed. It seems goalkeeper Emiliano Martinez will return to Arsenal this summer. Uh, apparently, he's been told by the club that he's wanted as the number two. And after thinking about it on his summer holidays, he's decided that he will come back to the Arsenal. Now, he's been uh, on record in the past as saying that he needs more first team football, etc., etc., um, you know, but the opportunity to stay at a huge club like Arsenal is obviously uh, very appealing to somebody like himself. Now, Emi Martinez, if he was Arsenal's number two, you know, he would get a fair few games, wouldn't he? He'd be able to play in the Europa League, in the cup competitions, etc., which is probably more opportunity than he's ever had at Arsenal. So I think Emi Martinez is probably going to give it one more season at the Emirates, see how things go. He's been on a few loan spells, done pretty well uh, wherever he's been. And, uh, you know, I think it makes sense to, to bring him back to the club and to give him some guarantees in terms of uh, playing time in some of the other competitions. Bern Leno has been given the number one shirt now, too. Um, but, yeah, I think this is a positive thing. And uh, fingers crossed it all works out because he's a goalkeeper that's got potential. I just feel like he's never really had the chance at the Emirates. So fingers crossed he gets those opportunities and he grasps them with both hands. And finally, uh, the Women's World Cup, England's Lionesses suffered a really disappointing defeat at the hands of the USA in the World Cup semi-final. Now, I say disappointing because they were so close, so close to, to getting through. Um, the USA took the lead through press after 10 minutes. Ellen White leveled things for England just nine minutes later. Uh, Morgan put the USA back in front in the first half and England had a goal ruled out by VAR, but it was correctly ruled out. I've got to say that. Uh, she was just slightly offside, Ellen White. Um, and I know VAR gets a lot of stick these days, and there are a lot of people who are dead against it. But in this case, it got the decision right. So you have to be fair uh, in that particular situation. Then England were awarded a penalty thanks to VAR, which I didn't think really was a penalty. It looked really soft, in my opinion. But that's the problem, isn't it? When you slow things down and you watch multiple angles... If the VARs told you to look at it, then in your head already, you already think you've missed something and you're going to be looking for any slight bit of contact to justify why the VAR has pulled this up. Um, England were awarded the penalty and Houghton, the captain, she missed it. The keeper saved it. It was a poor penalty in truth. Um, but she's been brilliant for England in this tournament. So it's unfair, in my view, to point the finger at her. Uh, a couple of talking points from the game. Uh, Alex Morgan did the little tea celebration when she scored her goal. Um, and a lot of people took offence to that. I think it was just good banter, if I'm honest. Uh, so fair play to her for that. She's a fantastic player, one of the greatest ever in uh, women's football. Uh, but just overall, my thoughts on the Women's World Cup. And, and I've seen quite a bit of it, actually, more than I thought I would watch, I guess, being starved of, of football 
has kind of driven me to it. And and that's I don't mean that in an offensive way. I mean it in the sense that if you had said to me at the start of the competition, will I watch any of it? I probably would have told you no. But I have seen quite a few games. I've probably seen 10, 11 games in full, not to mention all the highlights that I've watched as well. And I was, I've been pleasantly surprised by the standard. I still think it's got a long way to go uh, before it reaches anywhere near where the men's game is at. And that's not me being sexist. But men's football is just further down the progression line, isn't it, than the women's game is at this moment in time. Um, but I was pleasantly surprised by, you know, some of the the uh, the technical ability that's been on show, some of the tactics that have been on show. It feels like women's football has taken a good step in the right direction. Um, and, you know, I'll no doubt pay more attention to it than I have in the past. I probably won't be watching it every single week but I'll pay attention more than I have done in the past and I think that's kind of the key here I think the World Cup's been a great advert for women's football Um, it's not been a great advert for VAR mind you but it's certainly been a great advert for women's football and uh, I encourage people to take a little bit more interest in it because it's certainly on the up Um, not saying replace your uh, weekly dose of the Arsenal first team for the Arsenal women's team quite yet but it is on the right path and it is on the right track uh, so credit to everybody involved and and to the England uh, national team who uh, got all the way to the semi-finals and let's make no mistake about it the USA are the reigning world champions they're the best women's team in the world so there's no disgrace um, in losing to them it was just a little bit defeat uh, a little bit sorry disappointing in the way it happened in the fact that England had a goal ruled out and that England did miss a penalty and the opportunity to level things and take it to extra time. That brings me to the end of today's Chronicles AFC Daily. Thank you once again for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button if you're new. If you're listening via the audio, subscribe, share, uh, leave us a review too. That is really, really important for us uh, in terms of where we rank. Uh, Thank you so much. And uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Or later on, if we hear any more transfer news. I said that yesterday and I ended up having to do a second video. Um, So, yeah, we'll see. I'm not ruling it out at this moment in time. Come on, the Gunners.